I read an article in Esquire magazine about the Rosewood incident, and I saw it. It was on a newsstand. It was on a newsstand in Robertson, Robertson, and um, I think of Robertson and Beverly. And I, I opened up Esquire. I used to go to newsstands late at night and not buy the magazine. I just read the articles in the magazine. I just leave it up there. <laughs> not that I was cheap, but just like I was. Just at the end of just going, you know, just out of lark and reading it. So I read this article, and I, and I, it's not that I didn't think anything of it. I just like, that's just terrible, right? And then John Peters, who actually was running the studio when I did Boys in the Hood, but he ended up um, coming out of, uh, uh, of that deal at Sony, he bought the rights to the, the, the Esquire article. So John Peters called me up and said, I bought the rights to this thing. I want, I want to do it with you. And, um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I looked at it again, and then he sent me down to Florida. <clears throat> and mind you, this is the first time I'd ever been around people who actually had been victims of, mm. like, you know, of historical institutionalized racism. You know, like, you know, like, as I, you know, I'd been down to the South before on, fam- you know, on trips and stuff. They send black kids down South a little bit for the yeah. summer and stuff. But to actually be there with people, these people were in their, some, uh, at the time they were in their 70s and 80s, mm. some in the 90s. And they were telling me the stories about what happened, you know, in, in 1922, um, you know, during, during when their town was like burned and, you know, that land was taken away from them. People were murdered and killed, you know, by this incident. Rosewood incident, and um, and I was like, whoa, you know, you know, I was I was floored by it. I originally had plans to do this other picture that uh, Frank Price brought the rights for me for um, um, a book called Makes Me Wanna Holler, which I still want to do. And so um, I, I was like thinking, okay, this is interesting and stuff, right? And I'm leaving, talking to these people, um, and and mind you, the the younger generation stopped me. Now, mind you, they're in their 80s and 90s, so the younger generation is like in their 60s, right? The 50s and 60s. And there's these like thick black women, you know, they got the big old arms and stuff like this and like this, like, the, you know, the big mama arms. And this one woman, I forget her name, she's aunt and stuff, right? She's like, she say, she's like, baby, you gonna do the movie, right? I said, well, ma'am, I gotta get back to LA and I gotta look it over the stuff and I gotta like think about it and everything. Cause I'm still thinking, of, maybe I'll do Make Some Holler and maybe I'll figure this out. And then she says, she, she pushes me with all her, with all the boobs and the arms and everything in the corner. She says, no. <laughs> I was like, no, she says, she says, baby, you have to do this movie. This is, you have to do, if you don't do this movie, it's not going to be, the story's not going to be told. You have to do this movie. She says, listen. I said, okay, ma'am. You know, this, this, this. She says, I'm, I'm trying to get past her, you know, and these big old boobs and arms and stopping me and stuff. She says, listen. Either you do this movie or Steven Spielberg's gonna do the movie. And we don't want him. <laughs> she says this to me, right? And I said, okay, man, right? So then I go and I start, I get, I look at the article, I look at the, the old newspaper accounts. And then I started reading about how there were several soldiers coming back from World War I, and they were black men who had fought. You know, they were the first ones who actually fought outside of the country, you know, for, you know, for the freedom of this country. And their exposure to Europe and, and, and you know, and, and fighting the Germans and everything, you know, changed them mentally to have to come back to deal with institutionalized racism mm-hmm. in the South. And so, and there's just always this, this falsehood within um, American um historical records and everything like this, that black people were so benign in their persecution. And, and I've always hated that because, you know, in my family, you know, they tell stories about, you know, we didn't always get our ass kicked. You had to, you fought back, you had to move. That's why a lot of people, um, the Great Migration, you know, when all this stuff, it was not just the Great Depression. You have people who were, were persecuted economically together, poor whites and blacks. It's gonna be some stuff, right? Some, some shit mm-hmm. happening. So a lot of people went up to Chicago and New York, but within those skirmishes of the institutionalized racism, there were there were rapes, there were murders, mm-hmm. there were assaults against children, and black people didn't all just take that shit. Man, they they fought back, you know what I mean. So, but they, they you know the white mainstream never writes about that. So, um, and I just said, you know what, 
I know that this happens, and my, my grandparents and grand grandparents know this happens, that people fought back. If there's a, if there's a character in here that's from the was come back from the war, I can I can find a kind of a sense of uh, uh, thing, things of some type of re resonance with contemporary audiences that is historically based in fact that I can put in within the story because that's what they were saying in the accounts. They said some of the World War One veterans were fighting back once their families were being murdered, and so that you know that's how that came about the character of man that I got Bing mm -hmm. Rames uh, to play, Marion Doherty, who is a classic. <laughs> Classic um, cast director. Um, she did a lot of movies with George Roy Hill, and she, she, you know, she did so many different diff different pictures o over time. She discovered so she did she did I think she did Midnight Cowboy mm -hmm. um, with John Schlesinger, um, Marion Dorian and associates. She was in New York for many many years, right? Um, we're trying to figure out who's going to uh, who else is going to be in the picture, and she says, "Why not John Voight?" And I was like, "Wow, you know, because John had taken a hiatus." So John comes in, he has a meeting with me, and we're sitting there sizing each other up. And I'm like, I'm fucking sitting here with John Voight. I'm like, wow, you know, like, you know, from, from Coming Home to, to Men That Cowboy to a great movie that he did, uh, Runaway Train. I think he was nominated for Best Actor for that too, one of Andre Konshalovsky. And, you know, we're just talking and stuff. And so we went, me, Ving Rams, John Voight, and um, Don Cheadle. We went down to the south, and we went up making this movie. And we, we, we took two or three acres, and we built two towns. We carved out both of these towns out of swampland. Mm -hmm. we, we moved houses. We set up a mile length of railroad track. We airlifted a, a vintage train from the twenties and put it on there on the track and everything and stuff. Right, mm -hmm. and we made the town of Sumner, which was the white town, which was a company town which was based on the lumber industry and the cedar mill industry and stuff, right? Where the company actually owned the homes of the people. They owned the store. They kept those people in. And, you know, there were white people kept in economic persecution. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? They had to work at this company, and the company would just keep them in debt. Mm -hmm. And then you had the black town um, of Rosewood, where, because it was segregated, they basically were subsistence livers. They had, mm -hmm. they had the grow their own food, they had their own livestock, you know, um, they could sell, they could sell, um, um, I guess it was, um, yeah, they, they had a little bit of cedar and they said, mm -hmm. think of the turpentine, they made turpentine and stuff. And because, and they, they weren't rich, but they had their own thing, there, there was this economic tension. So what I was trying to do was show people that, you know, that a lot of this stuff in terms of, this all goes back to the old Richard Pryor joke, a lot of this tension comes not just from the differences of how people look, but also people having assumptions of, of well, like the character says, like you know, you know, like why does that nigga have a piano and I don't have one, right? Mr. Cumner, who's the rich white guy on the hill, who's who's fucking everybody, he has a piano, you know, and that nigga got one, I don't got a piano. So that's what racism mm -hmm. is. It's like you know, it's just, it's just like who's, who's got a one upsmanship on anybody, yep. and so I, you put in that. And it unoccurred of that, and you have a kind of combustibility. So you have even more of a moral conundrum on it. And I think that that's what makes that picture more profound because um, there's not the broad strokes of villainy and there's shades of gray, you know, of, you know, of right and wrong and mm. whatever.